Good evening and welcome to Refuge. My name is David. I am one of the pastors here. It is so good to be here with you tonight to worship with you as we continue the series on Lent that Nicole kicked off last week. Nicole introduced us to three practices that are normally associated with Lent. That's fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Tonight we're going to be looking specifically at prayer, what it is and even what it is not. You know, there are over 650 prayers listed in the Bible. There are over 450 recorded answers to prayer in the Bible. The Bible records Jesus praying 25 different times during his ministry. And Paul mentions prayer 41 times in Scripture. There's a book called How God Changes Your Brain, Breaking Through Findings from a Leading Neuroscientist. And the author talks about what he calls the prayer effect. And he says, when we pray and meditate on God, we enhance neural functioning of the brain in ways that improve physical and emotional health. The prayer effect on our brains has both short and long-term benefits. The long-term intense engagement with the divine permanently restructures the part of our brain that controls mood, self-perception, and the way we look at the world. Prayer can lead to increased peacefulness, social awareness, and a more compassionate world view. So as we talk about prayer tonight, I want to ask you a question. Has there ever been a time in your life or times in your life where you had a mountaintop experience? Now, we've all experienced those times in our lives where we felt like we were on top of the world, that life couldn't get any better than that moment. Do you have those experiences coming to your mind right now? Maybe it's the birth of your child. Maybe it's getting married. Maybe it's a specific trip that you took or a specific gift that you got from someone. The examples can be endless. I mean, there are a few that come to my mind personally. Of course, my wedding day three years ago, of course, is the first thing that comes to my mind, marrying my best friend on the beach in Naples. Man, that was a perfect day. Another mountaintop experience, and I guess I can say bucket list experience for me, was when I was able to go to a Carolina versus Duke basketball game at the Dean Smith Center. Now, I was a grad student at the time at Carolina, and it was always a dream of mine ever since I was even in the crib, I think, to eventually go to a Carolina Duke game at Carolina. People paid thousands of dollars for tickets to this one game. And it just so happened that I was able to get a ticket. Now, these weren't the best seats in the house, and you can get a little dizzy by the lack of oxygen for how high you were sitting, but I was at the game nonetheless. Not only was I able to go to this game, but we won that game too. And then there was the after party on Franklin Street. If you don't know what that consists of, just Google after party on Franklin Street, and you will see exactly what that consists of. Now, there are other mountaintop experiences in my life that I've had, but those are the top ones. But as we all have had those mountaintop experiences, my next question, and the one that I have been asking myself lately, is have any of your mountaintop experiences been a personal experience with God? And if so, What did that look like? What did it feel like? And can we even have a mountaintop experience with God? Well, I did some research to find out where the term mountaintop experience came from. And wouldn't you know, it just so happens to come from the passages of Scripture that we are looking at tonight. We'll be examining passages from both Exodus 33 and 34 because both capture the intimate moments Moses had with God. When we look at these passages and talk about prayer, it's important to notice that the word prayer isn't even mentioned in those two chapters. 
So most of you know this story and probably grew up watching the movie about it when it came on during Easter, The Ten Commandments. We would always gather around the TV to watch Moses. Most of us know the story of the children of Israel being set free from uh, slavery in Egypt. God chose Moses to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. <laughs> Pharaoh says, no, I will not let your people go. Well, it, as you know, it took frogs and flies and the river turning to blood and the angel of death passing over through Egypt before Pharaoh finally let them go. And you know the story. Pharaoh set them free. Moses led them out of captivity. They were eventually chased by Pharaoh and his army. God split the sea with Moses' staff. The children of Israel walked through the very first and the largest aquarium ever. And you would think that would be enough right there for the children of Israel to say, you know what? God has done so much for us. We will follow him for the rest of our days. You would think. But we all know that's not the case. And after Moses led them out of captivity, God called Moses to the top of the mountain, and that's where he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Well, after that cool encounter where God talked through a burning bush of some kind to Moses, Moses came back down to the mountain to give the Israelites what God had given him, only to find that these crazy kids had decided to make a golden calf and were bowing down and worshiping it instead. Well, Moses got mad. He broke the tablets, to which God then told Moses, all right, dude, you need to come back up here. We need to have another conversation. That's like being called to the principal's office for something that you did not do. On a side note, I will never forget one of my former students who was also one of my basketball players. I was not only his coach, but I was also his principal, too. I remember I called him to my office one day just to chat about his grades. And as he was about to leave my office after our conversation, he said to me, Mr. Thomas, don't take this the wrong way, but you scare me. I think you scare all of us, Mr. Thomas. You scare us so much that I think monsters must look under their bed before they go to sleep to make sure that you're not under their bed. I was just scared to death walking to your office not knowing what I did. Well, I can imagine that if you multiply that by a million, that's probably how Moses felt going back up the mountain to have another conversation with God. So here he goes back up to the mountain to the principal's office per se, and that's where we find him in Exodus 33 and 34. You see, Moses had this tight relationship with God. This unique relationship with God where he talked to God in person. Exodus 33, 11 says, And God spoke with Moses face to face as neighbors speak to one another. We're going to be doing some jumping around here, so let's jump to Exodus 34, 28. It says, Moses was there with God 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't eat any food. He didn't drink any water. Now, I know while we're talking about Lent this season, and Nicole talked about fasting last week, and just to ease your minds, I'm not going to ask you to fast for 40 days and 40 nights without food or water. But it's the encounter that Moses had with God is what we're going to talk about tonight and how that correlates with prayer. Specifically, one request that Moses asked God to do when he is on that mountaintop with them. As God and Moses are having this conversation, Moses in Exodus 33, 18, asked God, show me your glory. Seems like a simple request to ask the God of the universe, right? When you look at that translation of that verse and what the term glory means, God's glory is who he is, his character, how he thinks, how he feels, his perfection, his passion, his personality, his plans and purposes, his power, and his presence. So when Moses made this request before God, God did not dismiss it. But God did tell Moses in Exodus 33, 19 through 23, he says, I will make my goodness pass right in front of you. 
I'll call out the name of God right before you. I'll treat well whomever I want to treat well, and I'll be kind to whomever I want to be kind, but you may not see my face. No one can see me and live. Then God said, look, here's a place right beside me. Go put yourself on this rock. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll take my hand away and you'll see my back, but you won't see my face. This is God's way of showing himself to Moses and honoring his request. But God goes even further and tells Moses what kind of God he is when he is showing him his glory. We see their conversation continuing in Exodus 34 where God wants Moses to know his glory through his characteristics, the kind of God he is. I love this part. Exodus 34, 5 through 7, God descended in the cloud and took his position there beside Moses and called out the name God. God passed in front of him and called out God, God, a God of mercy and grace, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love for a thousand generations, for forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. God wanted Moses to know, and he wants us to know tonight, the kind of God he is. And when he sits with God, when we have a conversation with him, God wants us to know of his mercy, of his grace, of his patience, of his love, of his loyalty, and his forgiveness. Moses asked God for one thing, show me your glory. God showed him just that and even more. And after those 40 days and nights passed, after that beautiful time with God, Moses came down from the mountaintop. And Exodus 34, 29 and 30 says, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai carrying the two tablets, he didn't know that the skin of his face glowed because he had been speaking with God. Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, saw his radiant face, and held back, afraid to get close to him. Now, I grew up hearing this story, and I cannot, for the life of me, get this picture out of my brain. As a kid, hearing this story and hearing that Moses' face was glowing, this image always pops in my brain as a kid. Now, I know Moses didn't light up like a glow worm, especially when you squeezed him, but his encounter with God was so personal that it showed through Moses' face and his countenance. So the Israelites were afraid of the new glowworm Moses because they didn't have that kind of experience with God. The way that the Israelites understood the holiness of God was both powerful and it terrified them at the same time. So they see firsthand the powerful work of God through the face of Moses. But the glow on his face was also terrifying to them at the time. And in the last few verses in Exodus 34, it says, When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But when he went into the presence of God to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. When he came out and told the Israelites what he had commanded, they would see Moses' face, its skin glowing, and then he would again put the veil on his face until he went back in to speak with God. Now, why is that significant to us today? Why is the veil significant to us today? It's significant because we can jump all the way from Exodus to the New Testament to the person who is known as the new Moses, and that's Jesus. Moses was the lawgiver. Jesus came to set us free from the law. Throughout the Old Testament, the veil separated God and his people to which only the high priest could go beyond the veil to make the sacrifice on behalf of the people. And then Jesus came, gave his life for us, tore the veil in half to signify that we have direct access to God through his death and resurrection. 
You see, Moses encountered God on the mountaintop where God revealed his glory to him, where God showed Moses who he really is, his mercy, grace, patience, love, loyalty, forgiveness. And then Jesus came and showed us that through him, we too can experience all of that. And then Jesus taught us about prayer throughout his ministry. The first thing he said about prayer was in Matthew 6. And I love how the message translates this. Matthew 6, verse 5, Jesus says, When you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for 15 minutes of fame. Do you think God sits in a box seat? You know, being in the ministry for as long as I have, this is something that I've witnessed so many times, especially whenever I was in seminary. You would hear people, I even hear people, you know, on TV, people trying to pray to uh, impress others with their words and analogies. So let me give you some examples of this, of what Jesus is talking about, prayers that I've even heard people pray out loud where I was slightly confused. And if you have used these phrases while you pray, I'm judging you. (laughs) Just kidding, not really. How about this one? Jesus, I pray for a hedge of protection as we travel today. What exactly is a hedge of protection? I mean, it makes me think of shrubs and hedges in your garden. Or how about this one? Holy Spirit, we ask that you land on our runway of praise tonight. Jesus is a 747 or a stealth bomber. Or how about this one, my all-time favorite? And I actually laughed out loud when I heard this one. Holy Spirit, I pray that you swoop down on us tonight as we worship you. This one, I'm confused about. I can picture the Holy Spirit perched inside the church like a vulture. And when he sees people worshiping him, he starts swooping down on them like a bird swoops down on his prey. So I think it's important that Jesus gave us a model on how we are to pray, not using words like that. So as we continue to read from Matthew 6, we can see how Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. He says in verse 6, all right, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques, forgetting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, You can pray very simply like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. In prayer, There is a connection between what God does and what you do. We all know or at least are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. It's the most repeated prayer in the Christian faith. But Jesus gave his disciples that prayer to provide them and us with five areas of focus when we pray. Focus on God's everlasting glory. Hallowed be thy name. Focus on God's eternal will, your kingdom come. Focus on our present, give us each day our daily bread. Focus on our past, forgive forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us. And focus on our future, lead us not into temptation. Jesus gave that prayer as an example, but he also gave his life so that we can have direct, direct access to him. And our prayers don't have to be eloquent with big words. Jesus just wants us to talk to him. We can learn from the encounter Moses had with God and the life 
death and resurrection of Jesus, that God wants a relationship with us. I know to some it may be difficult to talk to someone we can't see. And more than that, talking to someone where it feels like a one-way conversation at times. And as we go through this Lent season and focusing on prayer, think about how you pray. Think about when you pray. Think about if you even pray at all. Just like Moses and Jesus both did, they would go by themselves to talk to God. They removed all distractions in order for them to have a conversation with God. There are many ways to pray to God, but there's no wrong way to do it. All of us in this room have a different relationship with God right now. So we should be able to talk to God in whatever way makes us feel comfortable individually. I can remember when I worked at the summer camp for 10 years in North Carolina, I was talking to this one kid who told me that he wanted to pray to God, but he never has before, and he didn't know how to start. I told him just to talk to God like he was sitting right in front of him. He and I were sitting in chairs, and what I did was I pulled up another chair, and I said, now God's joining us. So talk to him like you would talk to your friend. So the first words out of his mouth, the first words he ever said to God were, what's up, God? <laughs> and that was one of the most beautiful prayers I have ever heard. Why? Because it was genuine. That's what God wants from us when we pray. And I'm not here tonight to tell you that you must pray every day during this Lent season or during your life. But I'm here to ask, maybe you give it a try. My prayer time is whenever I'm driving it in my truck. I talk to God like he's in the passenger seat. And I definitely need to talk to him like he's in the passenger seat whenever I'm driving in southwest Florida. <laughs> because he also hears some other choice words whenever I'm driving down here too. And then I tell him, I'm sorry. My prayer is not structured. It's not formal. It's just me. Country boy David talking to his God. I know tonight has been a little short, but I want to close with the words to a song that I absolutely love. It's called Talking to Jesus. The first verse says, Grandma used to pray out loud by her bed every night. To me, it sounded like mumbling, like she was out of her mind. She said, boy, this kind of praying is what saved my life. You ought to try it sometime. And now I know she was right. She was talking to Jesus. She had been talking to Jesus for all of her life. And then the last verse says, there's no wrong way to do it. There's no bad time to start. You don't have to sound pretty. Just tell him what's on your heart. Because it's not a religion, because it's more like a friendship. Just talk to your father like you were his kid. Just start talking to Jesus. You can talk to Jesus whenever you like. Just like the song says, there's no wrong way to do it. Just tell him what's on your heart. Maybe you pray while driving, cooking, hiking, working working out. Maybe you pray best while connecting to nature or singing. There are endless ways to pray. And our faces might not glow like Moses, but when we come to Jesus, when we pull up that chair and we ask Jesus to sit with us for a while, then we might just have a mountaintop experience with him. And if you really don't know how to approach God or what to say, can I give you a suggestion? Maybe start with, what's up, God? And go from there. Let's pray as the band comes up. And just like that, God, we close out this time. 
We thank you for the fact that we can come to you where we are, no matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing, just as we are, that we can just have a conversation with you. And God, we know that you will speak to us in your own way, whether it's through that still small voice, whether it's through music that we hear, whether it's through certain circumstances, whether it's through other people, whether it's through Scripture. You want to talk to us. You want us to listen to your voice, that still small voice. You want to meet with us. You want us to pull up that chair to have that mountaintop experience with you. And we thank you for Jesus and the fact that that veil was torn, that he gave his life in order for us to be able to have that chair pulled up next to us and just talk to you.